morning and welcome to Represent Budget Night 2015. I'm Rachel Ward, helping you dissect this year's budget. In Treasurer Joe Hockey's second speech, he's taken a totally different tact than his first broad-scale budget repair job. This budget is about making people get up and be productive given the good conditions the government is saying it's created. This includes getting parents, mature-aged workers, mentally ill people, disabled people and young people into the workplace. Key pieces of legislation include the family package, giving back to small businesses and monitoring tax avoidance from our multinationals. We're joined tonight by an all-star panel of young politicians, economists and broadcasters, all of whom will be helping us break down the issues in this year's budget. Rashani Eber, editor of Catalyst magazine and journalism student at RMIT. She has previously worked for Acclaim magazine, UN Youth Australia and SIN. Branwell Travis, Labor Party activist and Labor member, studying a Bachelor of Urban and Regional Planning Honours at RMIT University. Joey Maloney, Editor-in-Chief of the Economic Student Society of Australia and Honours Economic Student at the University of Melbourne. Aaron Lane is a lawyer and public policy analyst, currently undertaking his PhD in economics at, the University of Mel at RMIT University, formerly president of the Young Liberals and an active member of the Liberal Party over the past decade. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Don't forget, you can be part of the conversation too. Follow us on Twitter, at SinRepresent, and use the hashtag RepBudget to send through your budget questions and comments. You can also join us online via Periscope and YouTube live stream, and these links can be, be, can be found on our Twitter page. For the past few days, Represent Assistant Producer Claudia Long and reporters Emma Cohen and Yen Erickson have been busy preparing for today's budget lockup in Treasury. During the lead-up, they got a taste of what it's like to be in the nation's capital during one of the busiest times of the year. Here's what they got up to. Represent joined 2SER from Sydney for two days of prep, training and reading lots of paper for the federal budget. This is what that looked like. The budget is over 800 pages long and getting familiar with it is the most difficult thing. Our team got to work breaking the 2014 pages down to prepare ourselves for this year and also doing other Canberran political reporter things including collecting snacks, sightseeing, chasing pigeons and looking at beautiful gardens with absolutely nobody in sight. So what does budget 2015 all mean? Well, we don't quite know yet, so stay tuned for our coverage live from Canberra tonight for Represent. So we know some of the big ticket items in this year's budget has been the small business package and the families package. Aaron, what was your response to the families package? Look, um, I, I think what we've got tonight is a range of new spending measures, um, a, a three and a half billion dollar package. Uh, and, and I think that will be pretty well received um, by families uh, at the moment um, because it, it increases uh, the sort of the net income available for certain sort of families and particularly those at the lower end of the, the income scale. Uh, and so I think those changes for uh, the, particularly the, the family tax benefit uh, will be well received for the lower income. Uh, you know, thresholds. And, and I think that's um, uh, one of the big differences that will be commentated about in this budget will be that um, perhaps that shift uh, into, you know, creating a, a welfare system and a, and a tax support system that looks after those that most need it and really uh, drives the focus into getting into work. And so, and, and we see that through uh, activity. Uh, thresholds uh, in, in tax arrangements, uh, in, the, in the family tax benefit arrangements. Uh, we see that through uh, the activity arrangements in the childcare package. Uh, and, uh, and we've also got that activities uh, tests in other areas like, uh, you know, New Start Allowance, for example, mm -hmm. as well. And so uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's building on that uh, earn or learn, if you like, from, from last year's budget, um, but really emphasising that the that, that welfare system and taxpayers' money in particular needs to be designed to uh, help those that are in most need rather than uh, those that are sort of in the, in the middle class and, and the mm -hmm. higher income streams. Bramwell, I'm interested to hear what you 
think, because last year one of the criticisms of the budget was it wasn't helping the lower cl uh, working class people as much. What did you think about this year's budget? Mm, this time last year, Joe Hockey delivered one of the most unfair and ideologically driven budgets that our generation has ever seen. Um, it was built an, around the framework of a, a budget emergency and trying to fix a so-called debt and deficit disaster. Now this year's budget, you didn't see any of that language surrounding it. Um, you saw a budget that was trying to frame itself around um, being supportive of families and being uh, built around the idea of fairness. But at the heart of it, it still is built around um, some of the, the broken fragments of the last budget. And the, the family package that was sort of um, included in this budget, so the um, $3.5 billion over four years um, uh, for childcare, as well as some changes to the paid parental leave scheme, are, are largely funded by some changes to the family tax um, benefit, um, which, which it's really taking um, money out of people's hands in, in one hand and then giving back to them um, in another hand in the form of childcare. Um, so what we see is it's sort of balancing each other out, but it's not really any great new expenditure for families, it's just sort of a, a readjustment of the spending that currently exists. Mm -hmm. Rashani, I'm interested to hear what your initial reaction to the budget was and to a couple of things Branwell's brought up about families. Yeah, I somewhat agree with Branwell. Um, it's kind of ridiculous that they have come out and said that it's fair it, and they've just taken a completely sort of, they've, they say that it's a different, it's different from last year's budget but I think they're just trying to make up for all the mistakes they made last year really um, and trying to steer away from that earn or learn sort of mentality that they had. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's great what they've done with New Start and that they've reduced it from six months to four weeks um, for under 25s. But uh, that being said, the amount that they're investing in metadata um, retention is pretty ridiculous. So, Just quickly, Joey, what was yeah. your initial reaction to the budget? Um, initially, mixed. There's some good things in there, some bad things. Uh, on a micro level, the families package and the small business package, is, there's some really good stuff in there. There's some odd stuff in there as well. What do you I mean by odd stuff? Um, stuff that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but I'm sure we'll talk more about that later. But just on a macroeconomic level, um, I think it's pretty good. I think now's not the time for a big fiscal contraction, as they attempted to do last year. Um, I think we need to uh, complement what the RBA is trying to do with expansionary monetary policy, mm -hmm. uh, it's because we've got low inflation, employment ticking up, and growth low as well. <coughs> So, what did we think about the multinational tax avoidance? Uh, they're going after them, obviously. Aaron, what was your reaction when Treasurer Joe Hockey outlined that in the budget? Look, um, I, I think we all knew this was coming. Uh, it's, it's been a topic of conversation um, through the media now for uh, some months. And uh, it's, it's been a, a process of a detailed examination by the tax office. Um, my, my own view is that uh, while uh, the, these top 30 uh, multinationals uh, are being targeted uh, and they're going to have, uh, you know, going after, I think the, the Treasurer's words were in an interview after his budget speech, um, what, what, it, what it really is is as tightening up of existing uh, regimes in Part 4A uh, of the existing Tax Act. Uh, and I, I think that's the correct approach. Uh, I, I think it would be a bit overblown if the government was going to set up some new big uh, task force and uh, set up new legislation and new regulation. What they're doing is using existing mm -hmm. frameworks uh, to get the right result here. That's interesting. We'll explore that more in our finance finance segment. Right now we're going to head to a break. Remember you can keep involved in the conversation using the hashtag RepBudget. I think there will still be quite a few Liberal nasties in the budget. I think they can't help themselves. The people who put them there, the you know, big business and the big business lobby groups want to see further attacks on uh, healthcare and education uh, and renewable energy. So I think you're going to see a few of those. I think that we need to start thinking about childcare in the same way that we think about schools. And we need to start seeing it as education and something that everyone should be able to send uh, their children to. 
kind of no matter how much you earn, no matter whether you're at the top end of the scale or at the bottom end of the scale in terms of income. And welcome back. I'm Rachel Ward and you're watching Represents Analysis of the 2015 Federal Budget. That was former Deputy Leader of the Greens and Member for Melbourne, Adam Bant, discussing his take on this year's budget. Now we'll break down the main sections of the budget, starting off with welfare. Represent reporters Mahalia Dobson, Julia Pillay and Ivy McGowan explain what we already know about the lockdown today and what people wanted from this year's budget. The welfare portfolio encompasses assistance for families, seniors, people with a disability, carers and those most in need. With regards to the budget, it is important to look at what areas are in need of funding and who will be affected by any potential cuts. Here's what you need to know. Last year, $146 billion was allocated towards welfare spending, or 35% of budget expenditure. This includes pensions, unemployment benefits, family payments and childcare support. Anne Kennedy, Chairperson for the Community Child Care Association, would like to see an increased commitment to quality and early childhood, education and care services. Well, Community Child Care Association would like to see the Federal Government make an increased investment and commitment to quality and early childhood education and care services. Um, we'd also like to see a commitment to supporting vulnerable children and families so that they could access these services free or perhaps on a sliding scale depending on their income levels. And we would like also to see a commitment that uh, would not restrict access by people who, by families who are not working or studying. When asked what she predicted for this year's budget, she said the association believes the introduction of an activity test and a median pricing idea is most likely to be introduced. We think they will introduce an activity test which will possibly limit those families who are not working or studying to, to something like 10 hours a week which we don't believe is enough. They may also introduce a, what they're calling a median pricing idea, which is a benchmark figure for a daily fee, which from our estimation will be far less than what most people are currently paying, particularly in capital cities like Melbourne and Sydney. And so that would mean dramatic fee rises for many families. Last year, Dr Cassandra Goldie, CEO of the Australian Committee of Social Services, said the budget divides rather than mends. So, can we expect a mending budget this year? Represent spoke with Victorian Shadow Health Minister Mary Wooldridge about what she would like to see in this year's federal budget with regards to health and welfare funding for Victorians. Um, there's significant funding that comes from the federal government to health um, and there has been indication over a year ago um, from the federal government that in the out years they're going to change the basis of how they uh, calculate the growth funding that happens each year. So we do need to see a significant investment from the federal government into health and hospitals uh, and that that continues to grow in the years to come. Overall, it looks like many are hoping that this year Australia's welfare sector can fare well in terms of funding. Thank you, Mahalia, Julia and Ivy. We're going to head now to Skype to speak to Emma Cohen, who's reporting live from Canberra. Emma, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Rich, Jill. Wonderful. Finally, it's great to speak to you. Um, so, can you give us a rundown of the big ticket items in this year's budget? Sure. So there are things we already know about. The um, childcare package and our uh, small business package have been centrepieces of the budget, and I'm sure you guys have spoken about that tonight. But the things that we were focusing on in the lockup were around programs to assist young people into the workforce. So there's a couple of I thought I'd run by you quickly. One is $107.5 million to intervene with people who may have um, lost touch with the workforce and they're under 25. And there's another program to assist people with mental illness and disabilities getting back, back, back into the workforce, um, targeted at young people in particular. So there really is, really is a drive this year, I think, um, away from new start allowance and focusing on um, punishing young people to a rhetoric that's much more around enabling them um, to get on with finding a job. 
Yeah, so we heard in the messaging of the speech Joe Hocking, Joe Hockey talking a lot, a lot about him growing up in a small business and um, creating an environment for young people to sort of flourish with their employment. Were there any other aspects you thought were, were, were noteworthy? Sure. So um, Joe Hockey held a press conference in the lockup about four o'clock this afternoon, and he really spoke about the way that small businesses can move to big businesses very quickly now with startups. So his big message to all Australians, I think, is to, as he said, get up and get going and have a go at things. Um, and I think the framing of the budget this time around is very much around um, people increasing their own prosperity. And I'm sure that you guys can talk about whether or not um, there are some problems with that in terms of different access requirements that people have to things like jobs. But very much Joe Hockey um, wanted to put forward the message that everyone needs to get out, have a go, and small business and family business are kind of, I guess, it's a metaphor for the way we have all the acting um, from this budget. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, what were some of the surprises in this year's budget? Yeah, I think one thing is the absolute absence of anything around tertiary education. Claudia Long, our assistant executive producer, and myself were going through all of the papers looking to see what was going to happen in the face of university deregulation. Um, basically, there is very, very little. There is some policy cracking down on um, vet fee help and trying to eliminate, I guess, um, more problematic courses in the TAFE system and um, unofficial providers that we've seen over the past year. But apart from that, um, how universities are going to be funded into the future is anyone's guess. Absolutely. Thank you, Emma. No worries. So my question to the panel is, overall we heard that there's been a big push for people not to be reliant on welfare, for example, getting back into the workforce um, in a, 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 a variety of ways. Um, for mature age workers, people with disabilities and young people, Roshani, are you convinced? Is this going to work as a young person who will be looking for a job this time next year? Yeah, I don't. I'm not convinced at all, to be honest. Um, I feel like a person honestly has to have the drive to look for a job as well. And as this 200, I think, 12 million dollar for the that's going towards a new transition program, it's aimed at people that have been unemployed for a long period of time. Um, I just don't know if they can really push people like that to go for that kind of thing. But then, um, and the other thing is. They're cutting back so much money on aid and things like that um, to supply money for the New Start program, um, which I'm not too sure about if it's really going to work or not. OK, so that doesn't convince you. It doesn't, no. What about you, Branwell? Well, I think there are uh, many elements in this sort of youth uh, unemployment sort of program that are uh, sort of either walking back from what they did in the previous budget um, trying to fix what they did in the previous budget or sort of continuing along the same path of the last budget. Um, whilst it was really good to see, um, I think, $1.2 billion in sort of a wage subsidy program, which is one of the most effective way to sort of get people um, from welfare into work by actually getting them into a, a real job in a, a real employer, not sort of work for the doll doing sort of make work type of activities. Um, there were, you know, some other interesting things like a... The, the youth transitions program, which sound very very similar to the the youth connections program that was defunded in the last budget, mm -hmm. um, and whilst there was the, a reduction from the six month waiting period um, in order to gain unemployment benefits to four um, weeks, um, it still is the sort sort of same broken kind of ideologically driven sort of approach to unemployment. Mm -hmm. You need to support people into jobs by education, training, um, getting them into the workforce, getting them skilled up and giving them the employment skills. Yeah. And I just don't think this package gets there to really address the problem that we face. That's really interesting. I'm just going to go to Aaron. Um, Bramwell talked about sort of a backtracking from last year's budget. As someone who is an active member of the Liberal Party, mm -hmm. do you see this budget as that? No, no not at all. Um, I think what this budget does uh, is try and uh, address the youth unemployment crisis, and, and it is a crisis. Uh, and and I, I think, uh, I think the government's approach here, uh, while while there are targeted uh, measures that uh, Bremel sort of mentioned before, I think the the underlying fact is that government don't create jobs. The government doesn't create jobs in an economy. It's businesses that create jobs. It's businesses that employ people. 
and uh, yes, you, you need all that. You need an education system and a training system, and Australia has one of the best education systems in the world, and, and we should be grateful for that. Uh, but uh, it's, it's businesses that are going to get out there and create the jobs, and I think what this budget does, uh, in addition to those uh, targeted programs uh, for particularly for disadvantaged youth. I think in, in the small business package, in the startups package, uh, make it easier for people to start businesses uh, and, and to employ people. That's going to be the fix to youth unemployment. Um, and mm -hmm. it's particularly so in regional, uh, in Victoria, where I'm from, where uh, sometimes youth unemployment's up to 30%. Look, on that note, we'll head to a break. Stay tuned for the leader of the sex party, Fiona Patton. Um, on her take on all things budget, but we will be coming back to talk about the finance aspects of this budget, particularly the startups. So make sure you stay tuned. I would be looking at things like um, drug law reform and you know looking at legalising, regulating and taxing marijuana. I would be looking at the tax exemptions that we give to religious institutions and, and their surrounding organisations. I would like to see them probably pay their fair share of tax. I would like to see foreign companies that, that earn revenue in Australia pay their fair share of tax. Welcome back to represent coverage of the 2015 budget. That was leader of the sex party, Fiona Patton, discussing her take on the budget. We'll keep the ball moving, moving straight on to finance. Represent reporters Declan Williams and Emma Cohen with more. This year's budget is crucial. Our economy is slowing, business confidence is at an all new low and our mining sector has slowed dramatically in the last year. Proposals will be made to aid small business with tax cuts and streamlining a business setup. Along with that, the Abbott government will change some areas of the GST. But will this budget deliver for business? I'm a consulting economist with uh, basically my own company, and we specialise in sort of transport, infrastructure, and tourism areas. And I've uh, been working in economics for, my God, almost 40 years. And treasurer of the Economic Society of Australia, the Victorian branch. Because a GST hits directly at people's income, it's a very regressive tax. It hits people at the bottom a lot harder. So a bit like when the previous government introduced the carbon tax, they reduced, they raised the tax threshold from $6,000 to $18,000. Um, so it reduced the tax burden on people at the bottom um, and then eventually balanced it out by increasing it at higher levels. Um, but there would need to be compensation. I think that that's the critical thing, and it, there will be a bit of a boost to inflation when it when it comes in. So you know, we come back to things like firmly believing in the role of Infrastructure Australia, which is to look at major projects and to do a good economic cost-benefit assessment and say we will only fund those projects that provide a positive long-term return to the Australian economy. We don't fund projects where we're going to be actually getting less back than what we've spent. Um, those sorts of governance issues I think are critical, but a strategy that is able to be sold to the public, a clever strategy and a fair strategy but one that is probably a little bit tough. And that, I think, will build confidence and will get people spending on it. Oh. Greece's debt going into the crisis was 30% of GDP. Mm. It's now, uh, I think, 200% or even more. Mm. Um, they are in a major problem. The difficulty with, with not addressing debt is that if things do turn down, and they're not turning the right way for Australia at the moment with the decline in iron ore prices, and we have become overly dependent on that sector, mm. um, the difficulty is that the debt can blow out very quickly. <laughs> Represent reporters Declan and Emma there with that pre-budget insight. We haven't 
And not many too, too many surprises in finance either. Either The Treasurer announced that the tax-free threshold increased from $1 to $20,000 and a business cut of 1.5%. So, Joey, I want to go to you first. Last week, at Deloitte Access Economics thought the budget deficit would blow out to over $40 billion. Considering the government's level of debt, is now the time for the northern investment we heard about in Joe Hockey's speech? Um, that's a tough question to answer because it's hard to know exactly what benefits would flow from investing in the north. Uh, politicians have been talking about this idea for a long time right now, but... The idea that you could build some infrastructure and a city would spring up out of nowhere and you'd get a lot of economic activity is a bit dubious. Um, that said, uh, investing in infrastructure is always a good thing. Australia does have an infrastructure deficit, um, but I'm not sure that the economic benefits from that investment would be guaranteed, nor would they uh, accrue in time to have any positive effect on the budget bottom line. Mm -hmm. Branwell, is now the time to invest in the North? Well, uh, if you're looking for a surprise in the budget, I think that's one of it. And this will, it was one of, you know, Tony Abbott's um, flag, flagship sort of thought bubbles um, whilst in opposition. I'm just not entirely sure that, um, you know, in terms of his priorities, that he doesn't think that the federal government should invest in urban rail or public transport infrastructure, yet he thinks it's the, the federal government's place to sort of build a city. It just doesn't sort of seem to make sense. Okay, it doesn't make sense to you. Rashani, what do you think? Yeah, I much agree with Branwell. Like, it just doesn't really make too much sense. <laughs> yeah, I'm not too sure about the logic behind that reasoning. Okay, we've got a couple of negative people on this side. Finally, Aaron, <laughs> what do you have to say about investing in the North? Look, um, I actually um, agree with one of Brownwood's points about, you know, I'm not sure if it's the role of um, federal governments to establish cities, but I don't think that's what's being done here. Um, I, I think it's um, putting broad infrastructure in uh, cooperation with state and territory governments. And I think that's the difference. Um, I think, uh, as um, Brownwell said, this is... Uh, Tony Abbott wanted to be remembered as the infrastructure prime minister. And he is well on the way to doing that. Uh, and uh, it's, it's in contrast to Labor governments, Labor state governments, uh, in Victoria in particular, uh, that are ripping up contracts uh, for the east-west link, that are paying uh, what, up to $800 million not to build a road. Um, my understanding is that money is still there for Victoria uh, under the federal budget uh, if the, the Labor government will come on board. And, uh, and is also looking at investing in shovel-ready projects in this state that uh, um, the ALP simply don't have um, ready to go. Look, I'm sure Brownwell would have a lot to say about that, but we'll leave that for another time. Um, moving on now, Rashani, one of the big items in this budget is something called the Multinational Corporations Tax, the Netflix tax, if you like, extending the GST to intangible items like streaming services and e-books. As a young person who uses one of those streaming services, what do you feel about that? And do you think it will actually encourage a trend towards going back to piracy? Um, that's a good question. I personally don't condone it as somebody who does use those services. Um, you don't condone piracy, do you mean? No, not <laughs> piracy. I'm talking about Netflix. Oh. Um, but I, I don't know, I think that it's silly, it's a bit ridiculous to put a tax on something that people use because they're trying to use it because it's a cheaper option. Like, Rather than buying individual DVDs and things like that, people are now investing in Netflix um, because it's an easier option. It's a it's a cheaper option. Um, so to put a tax on a cheap service doesn't quite make sense to me. Like mm -hmm. um, there was the whole thing about Uber and Airbnb that you mentioned as mm. well. Allegedly, this is also going to sort of apply to sort of Uber and. Airbnb, sort of mm -hmm. any business that operates online, it sort of mm. also will apply to, which is an interesting... Because they're currently is... not covered by the GST. Yeah, yeah, I think so. What do you have to say about that? Um, I think it's a bit odd because the market's very young and it's still developing. And I think Australians have been particularly hard done by in this respect. We have had a hard time getting content uh, when it's ready to come out. And I think that's why Australians are some of the, uh, some of the largest per capita per capita. Uh, pirates in the world. Um, so I would have waited until the market was more mature and that the providers had sort of built models that people embraced more and moved away from piracy uh, before I would have started taxing it because uh, taxing it right now I think you'll just push uh, the few people that are doing the right thing 
and uh, using these services, you'll just push them back towards piracy. Mm -hmm. so, and I think it's pretty small fish too. I think that it's projected to raise only like less than half a billion dollars over the forward estimates. Uh, so on that front, it's, it's really not worth much either. Look, just staying with tax cuts, uh, we heard small businesses will receive a tax cut of 1.5% um, and receive a tax deduction on items up to $20,000. What did you think about that? Is that enough to save small businesses, perhaps those started by young people? Uh, hard to say if it's enough to save. That's probably a case-by-case -case basis analysis. But I think it's a good move. It's essentially a, a fiscal expansion move. You're lowering taxes, uh, which is a good thing. It's sort of at odds with the rhetoric about uh, debt and deficit disaster. But uh, I'll put the politics to one side. I think it's a good move because I think uh, right now you want, you want your monetary policy arm and your fiscal policy arm moving together. And we've got the RBA has cut rates by 50 basis points in the last two months. And it wouldn't make sense if the government uh, fiscal policy was trying to pull in an opposite direction. So by lowering taxes, they're complementing what the RBA is trying to do to uh, stimulate the economy a bit and get the macro indicators going back in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, just going back a bit in the discussion to the Netflix tax, what did you think about that, Aaron? Is it too small a fish to fry? No, I don't think so. Um, I think uh, it's, it's estimated to raise around $350 million a year um, in, you know, in, in net revenue. Now, um, you know, I, I, so I, I wouldn't say it's a small fish. Now, I, I think it's a brilliant service. Uh, I, I think these streaming services uh, that are being offered um, are terrific and I think consumers will be taking them up whether there's a 10% GST um, applied to them or not. Uh, I think uh, as a matter of fairness, um, businesses should be subject to uh, a, a level playing field and have the same regulations imposed on them uh, as in others. Um, but what I would say is that I wouldn't want to see GST revenue be increasing overall. Uh, I think this is a measure that can actually help lower the tax burden overall. Mm -hmm. That is really interesting. Sort of going after the multinationals seems a bit more palatable than going after perhaps individuals. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, oh, we, can, we can treat these guys differently if they have a bad reputation, we don't like them. But, oh, <laughs> on a service we like, no, we, we, can't, we can't touch that at all. The, the rules have got to be the same for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we're going to head to a Skype call with Represent reporter Claudia Long. Claudia, can you hear me? Absolutely, Rachel. It's great to be with you. Wonderful. Lovely to speak to you. So what were the surprises in this year's budget? We heard a lot about uh, measures to fight terrorism. Mm, yes, we did. Uh, we did hear a lot about that. That was one of the centrepieces of this year's budget. Uh, unsurprisingly, the government has been building up to that. There is a whole suite of uh, policy relating to that. There's also been a lot of uh, policy regarding young people and jobs as well. That's been another main uh, thing and also small business. Mm -hmm. Were there um, any impacts on Indigenous issues? Uh, I'm afraid that's more Emma's area of expertise. <laughs> uh, what I can tell you about is that everything to do with young people, jobs, employment, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions from our audience there, uh, seeing as we are a youth station. Yeah, you mentioned grants before um, to help young people get back into their jobs. Do you want to tell us a bit more about that? Absolutely. So the government's main, uh, one of their main centrepiece programs for their youth employment strategy is the Work Experience Program, which is going to be rolled out nationally. It's an $18 million program uh, that aims to get young people back into work. And essentially what it is, is for young people receiving their youth allowance. Uh, and it's an extra $20 dollars and 80 cents per fortnight and also a work experience placement that will last for a month. Uh, now, it is a bit of a contentious program. Many are arguing that the amount that people will be getting paid for their work won't be enough uh, to survive on. It's a very small amount. Only run for four weeks per plate money for many young people uh, and the program does augment. Mm -hmm. And we heard there was nothing about changes to higher education in the budget. Uh, did that actually surprise you, Claudia? We know you're a fan of Christopher Pine surprises. I do like a good surprise, and when I did hear Christopher Pine uh, had one planned, I was a little bit excited to find out what it was. And yes, higher education has been uh, noticeably absent from tonight's speech. It didn't really feature in the budget papers. However, uh, at a press conference today at Parliament House, which we attended, the Treasurer has committed to trying to get deregulation through the Senate. That's something very important to keep in mind. The government is committed to fee deregulation. 
Uh, so that is still part of their education policy. Mm -hmm. We're going to have yeah. to wrap it up there. Thank you, Claudia. Um, we're going to head to a break. And remember, you can be part of the conversation on social media. Tweet your thoughts, queries and any comments you've got at SinRepresent or just use the hashtag RepBudget. We'll be back after the break and take a look at the surprise changes that you just heard about in this year's budget. Welcome back, I'm Rachel Ward and you're watching Represents coverage of the 2015 budget. We didn't expect too many surprises in this year's so-called boring budget, but some interesting points did crop up. The first one I'm interested in talking about currently is the uh, intelligence capabilities and anti-terrorism measures. We've got $480 million um, for intelligence capabilities against ter terrorism and specifically $750 million to fight against Daesh. What did you think about that, uh, Roshani? Um, I just think it's a lot of money that we've scrapped from aid and we're putting towards counter-terrorism measures that we might not even need. Um, as a young person, I just don't see how we're reaping the rewards of investing this much money into something like that. I just, yeah, I can't justify that. That's an interesting perspective to have. What do you think, Joey? Um, I think national defence is important and we need to invest money into it. Um, so in that respect, I don't have huge problems with it. I think the metadata stuff that I assume the funding is going towards, I think was rushed through the parliament without a uh, proper process. Well, the process was proper, but I don't think it was given enough uh, concern. Um, but all in all, I don't have a particular objection to uh, spending on national defence when there is an obvious threat overseas. Mm -hmm. You mentioned metadata. We know Rashani's not a fan. Um, Branwell, Labor did pass uh, the government's measures on metadata and there are a couple of notable critics including Anthony Albanese, Albo. What do you think about this money which presumably will be directed towards metadata mm. retention? Well, it, it, it is very difficult to sort of judge what an appropriate figure in a budget for sort of national security, defence and, and those sorts of things really is. They're not necessarily subject to um, enormously transparent processes. There was some suggestion, um, so I think earlier this uh, this, uh, so er earlier last year um, when the uh, security agencies sort of were, were advocating for more funds to do um, greater sort of um, national security and, and sort of those sorts of activities um, that it, that they sort of sometimes will ask for things and they'll simply just get it and there's very little scrutiny of that. So like I, I can't sort of judge whether or not this is an appropriate figure um, for those um, threats that Australia may or may not be facing. Um, I suppose it's just I would like to see a more transparent process sort of attached to it and a greater scrutiny of where this money is going um, and how it is being spent. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it is early days. We've mm -hmm. just heard the budget. Um, but we're going to move on now to one of the surprises, which, as I mentioned, is we, don't ha we, ha we haven't heard anything about um, uni fee deregulation. Aaron, were you surprised that there was nothing in the budget considering Christopher Park? Christopher Pine had flag posted that in the weeks leading up to the budget? Look, um, no, I wasn't surprised about it. Um, I uh, heard Christopher Pine give a lecture um, only two weeks ago in Melbourne uh, where he made it very, very clear that he was sticking by uh, the changes that were proposed previously uh, and is looking at putting that package again through the parliament. Um, so uh, when it didn't come up, no, I wasn't particularly surprised by that, no. Mm -hmm. Um, the Senate remains, the crossbench remains hostile. Do you think he will actually get it through? I think there's some, uh, been some changes in, the, in the, uh, a few of those crossbench senators uh, since the last time it was passed. Um, look at um, Glenn R Lazarus, for example. Um, last time uh, he admitted, he openly admitted that he, he hadn't read the package. He simply voted for something he didn't understand what it was um, and, and was doing that on, mm -hmm. on Clive Palmer's instructions. He's now moved away from Clive Palmer and so there's, uh, there's him. Uh, Jackie Lambie is now sitting as an independent. Uh, Senators uh, Day and Lionhelm, uh, I think, are broadly supportive of, of those packages. 
Um, what it depends on, I think, is if the Labor Party are serious in continuing their reforms that they started. They started demand-driven reforms when they were in government. This is the logical extension of those excellent reforms. And I think it depends if, if Labor want to be a party that that cooperate uh, mm -hmm. and that do good things for the nation or if they want to just sit back and oppose for opposition's mm. sake. I'm not sure that full fee de deregulation is the logical extension of the demand-driven system because what essentially Pine's package proposed was let's just let market forces rip and we'll get price... Well, that's, that's not that correct. That's just simply that's, not correct. Uh, that's, that's the crux of it. I think that was the reason that the public rejected and I think that's the reason that uh, most of the Senate rejected it. Um, but I think this pack, the uh, higher education reforms need a lot more consideration. There is some scope to get some flexibility and fees, but full market forces is just not a possibility in such an information poor environment. Look, I'm sorry, I'd love to continue that discussion, but we are going to have to head to a break. Um, remember, you can tweet and send us all your thoughts at SinRepresent or use the hashtag RepBudget to join in the discussion. We'll be back with more <coughs> after this break. Welcome back, I'm Rachel Ward, bringing you Represent's analysis of this year's budget. We'll now take a look at healthcare and how funding will change for healthcare services this year. Something that's been rather controversial this year is the issue of the future of mental health services. Chief Executive of the Mental Health Australia says the funding extension was a, a boost for mental health in Australia, a moot, sorry. <laughs> because funds are coming from a different bucket that's funded differently. He argues that the focus for the next six months will be purely on their survival. Represent reporter Lucy, Edward, Lucy, Lucy Hinton taking a close look at this particular issue. Heading into this year's budget, the Abbott government has already announced an increase in funding to boost vaccination, extend support for mental health care groups and prevent cervical cancer. Some over-the-counter drugs such as Panadol and Aspirin will be cut from the pharmaceutical benefits scheme so that more money can go towards medical research. While all of this sounds promising, many fear the government is all talk and no action. The 12-month extension of funding has allowed groups such as Mental Health Australia and the Black Dog Institute to remain open. But this could just be a band-aid fix if no long-term solutions are found. The government is currently working on the mental health review that should indicate how best to fund and organise mental health care in Australia. I think it's hard to say at this point given that we're not actually very sure what that money is going towards in terms of specific projects and whether that's actually quite sustainable. Um, so it'll be very interesting to find out whether they've actually allocated the money um, towards certain initiatives. It's certainly a great sign that they're showing interest in this kind of area. And with these groups in particular that are kind of increasing awareness, increasing accessibility, um, I think it's certainly a good start. It looks like there will be no surprise cuts to healthcare in this year's budget, but people can only hope that the government sticks to their promise and steers clear of the widely disliked GP co-payments. Thank you, Lucy. So, unlike last year, there were no bombshells with health in this year's budget, but it's still an interesting time for healthcare. We've got the Medicare review and the Mental Health review set to be released later this year, leaving the door wide open for changes to both. So one of the biggest aspects in this year's budget from health was the no jab, no play policy. Uh, so basically, um, GPs are currently given an incentive of $6 to get their patients immunised and now it's going to be bumped up to $12. Um, what did you think about that, Branwell? Um, I think it's a really strong proposal. I think that ensuring that young Australians and kids are, are vaccinated is an important sort of public health policy. And I think that anything, um, you know, offering carrots to doctors to ensure that they sort of promote vaccination in their clinics, whilst also um, perhaps providing some sort of um, disincentives for families to not vaccinate their kids is a, a strong response to ensure that um, our young people are, are healthy. Mm -hmm. And I should just say that um, it applies to not only GPs but uh, health services more broadly. Aaron, this is, you talked before about government interfering in people's lives. This is saying you can't get uh, your welfare benefits until your child is immunised. How do you feel about the no jab, no play policy? Look, I think it's entirely consistent. I, I think, um, you know, we're talking about government benefits here. 
And so if, if people want to make that choice, they can make that choice. Um, I think, um, as Brian was saying, that there's the carrot and the stick approach, which I think um, is, is absolutely valid. And uh, I think uh, that, that there should always be certain conditions placed uh, on, on government benefits. Um, and, and this seems uh, like a good one to promote uh, a good public health policy. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to say about that, Joey? Yeah, I agree with Aaron. Um, I think it's obviously something that we need to do something about. We can't have creeping uh, non-vaccination rates. I think that would be a very poor outcome for public health. Um, I'm, just, I'm not a uh, behavioural economist, but I would be curious to know whether what strength of incentive or disincentive you would need to sway someone on this issue, because mm -hmm. from what I've seen, uh, anti-vaxxers are pretty dug in on the issue. That's true. Um, yeah, I would, be, I would be very interested to see if this actually has an effect. Mm -hmm. um, less money was given against domestic violence, um, but there has, as was promised, but there has been a $16.7 million boost to an awareness campaign. Uh, what did you think about that, Roshani? Were you happy with that amount of funding? Um, yeah, I'm just interested to see what, how this awareness campaign plays out. To mm -hmm. be honest, I can't predict what it's going to be like, but if it's successful or if it's actually effective that'd be great but I don't know if an awareness ca campaign is all that we need mm -hmm. when it comes to violence against women. What would you like to see more of? I mean awareness has been a big issue this well, year. What would you like to see next well, year? Well essentially we have to then look at the root of the, the, root of the problem which is the perpetrators. Um, it's not about creating awareness of violence against women. I feel like everyone in this room knows that that is a thing that happens. Um, I think it's about uh, not failing those women that have the, the victims um, and working on the parole system, essentially, which is where the problem is. Mm -hmm. um, just moving on now, another big part of the healthcare of healthcare measures in the budget was the uh, kickstart to the medical research super fund, including $600 million for cervical cancer trialling. Um, what do you think, uh, Branwell, about this medical research super fund, which you did hear about last year? Do you feel like it's taking away from other measures? Or are you happy to see the money being channelled into that? Well, I think you can never say no to funding in um, uh, sort of uh, healthcare and sort of trying to find cures to diseases and conditions um, that sort of affect us all. Um, the last in the last budget, this was a fund that was funded by the GP co-payment. The GP co-payment has now, after a, a couple of different versions of it, sort of been dropped dropped off the agenda. So I'm glad that there is some funding in this budget to go to that fund, and it's not being funded by taxing, you know, sick people. Yeah. Just quickly, Aaron, what did you feel about the healthcare measures outlined in this, year, this year's budget? Well, I, I think what we've seen, uh, like the Treasurer sort of foreshadowed, it was a dull budget. Uh, we haven't seen uh, the measures that were um, perhaps canvassed last year. Uh, and I, I think the government have learnt the lesson in that regard and mm -hmm. not to, not to um, bring forward massive changes to a system in the budget itself. Um, I think the, the best way to do that is uh, have, a, have a rather dull budget and then uh, have have a proper debate and a focused debate about issues going in the future. So I think mm -hmm. this um, this research fund is uh, but a terrific way uh, in addressing some of the long-term health I'm really health sorry. Costs. We're going to have to stop you there. That's actually all we have time for tonight. We hope you've enjoyed this special edition of Represent, breaking down the things the 2015 budget will have and affect you. Also, thank you to our panel members, Rashani, Branwell, Joey and Aaron, for joining me on the show tonight. I hope we've sort of demystified this budget for you a little bit. Don't forget you can continue the discussion on our Twitter page at SinRepresent or using the hashtag RepBudget. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Rachel Ward. Good night.